On May 11, 1986, Mother's Day, an Episcopal High School in Portland, Oregon, gathered together 15 of its students an hour before midnight to participate in the school's experiential outdoor program called Base Camp. Their goal, like many previous students before them were able to proudly accomplish, was to stand on the summit of Mount Hood within the next 12 hours. Bright-eyed, excited, and determined, these students, accompanied by five reliable adults, started their adventure at 3 a.m. the next day. Over the course of the next few hours, they would go on to experience a tragedy that will claim nine lives, making this expedition the second deadliest alpine accident in North American history. Mount Hood is the fourth highest peak at the geographic center of the Cascades volcanic arc. It stands at an impressive 11,249 feet above sea level, majestic and beautiful. The ice-capped peak of Mount Hood is otherworldly, alluring, and dangerous in the eyes of many. To climb such a mountain is a great educational experience for young adults, as it would help them grow by working together to overcome a harsh environment that required problem-solving and teamwork. As Outward Bound's founder Kurt Hahn once put it, the experience of helping a fellow man in danger, or even of training in a realistic manner to be ready to give this help, tends to change the balance of power in a youth's inner life. This is indeed the objective of Base Camp, the very program run by Oregon Episcopal modeled on the principles of Outward Bound and a requirement for all 10th graders. And so the Mount Hood Summit became the goal. In the months leading up to the spring of 1986, the students learned the technical aspects of snow climbing, how to step kick an ascent, how to plunge step a descent, how to execute a sitting glissade, how to self-arrest during a fall, and how to perform basic first aid in the field. Soon enough, it was the second Monday of May, and the students were ready. They geared up, bringing essential and life-saving tools like carabiners, seed harnesses, and prussic slings. They grabbed crampons, a field stove, a sleeping bag, a large nylon tarp, and two first aid kits. They also didn't forget to bring compasses, a set of long wands that would be used to mark their path on the way up and down, and a sturdy shovel for digging through hard, ice-crusted snow. This shovel will see much use in 17 hours, digging through four feet of snow to carve out a small cave that will shelter 13 exhausted people, shielding them from the harsh blizzard, and later, serving as their very own temporary grave. The trip began aboard a bright yellow school bus. The students, laden with heavy gear, took their seats one by one. It will take them roughly 90 minutes on the road to reach Mount Hood. In the meantime, they made their acquaintance with the adults who will serve as their guide on this trip. Thomas Gorman, the school's 42-year-old chaplain and an Episcopal priest as the group leader, settled in front of the bus. Marion Horwell, the Dean of Students and Student Affairs, a capable woman who had never climbed a mountain before, but had come along to support her school, also found her seat among the excited crowd. Only one parent was going, Sharon Spray, who was accompanying her daughter Hillary. After an hour and a half on the road, they made a stop at Timberline Lodge, a rambling structure that serves as a large ski area just west of the climbing route they would take. There they met with the last two members of their party, an outward bound instructor and Ralph Summers, a 30-year-old professional guide who looked like somebody's older brother. Before leaving Timberline, the group were issued ice axes and helmets. Then finally, they were ready to ascend. 15 students, one mother, one priest, one administrator, and two guides. 20 people in all, but only 11 will come down the mountain. Alive, but forever changed by tragedy. What exactly went wrong, and why? These are the questions that will plague everyone in the aftermath of this disaster. But for a long time, no one will be able to give a definitive answer. May 12th, 3 a.m. The group left Timberline and were met with temperatures that were comfortably above freezing. They were close to the tree line at 6,000 feet, wading through calf-deep snow in a hushed kind of darkness as they started on what would have been roughly a six-mile round trip. The forecast for Mount Hood that afternoon was not ideal. News organizations and weather services had predicted a severe storm that will last for days, with vicious winds and heavy rain surging in. But Tom Gorman assessed the conditions and decided that before the worst of the weather hit, the climb could still be completed safely anyway. 
Gorman was someone who was considered a good leader in many Oregon Episcopal climbs before the 1986 attempt. He knew to consider dangerous elements when climbing and knew how to make practical decisions to change plans when necessary. He was already a seasoned mountaineer even before he took a job at Oregon Episcopal in 1978, where he taught philosophy, ethics, and math. His students affectionately called him Furter Tom, from the abbreviation of father and doctor, as he was both a priest and a PhD. The kids adored him. Jim Thompson, assistant to the bishop for the Episcopal Diocese of Oregon in 1986, recalls, his popularity was astounding. And, of course, he had the reputation of being the brain on campus. By many accounts, Gorman seemed like a very reliable and conscionable man. But Joel Shallot, a 19-year-old senior in 1986 and a member of Gorman's advanced climbing team, had some doubts. Tom was a father to me, he wrote in an online magazine, but as I got to know him better, I began to sense that he was seriously troubled. Shallot, observing a streak of recklessness in Gorman's character, wrote about a certain expedition under Gorman's leadership, which happened on a rocky outcropping above Oregon's Sandy River. Once they reached the summit, they were instructed to anchor a rappelling line by tying it to a tree so they could practice belaying one another from atop the precipice, but the students were nervous and hesitant to proceed. To show that the maneuver was in fact possible, Gorman went on to demonstrate. As Shallot described it, he took off his helmet, screamed out, on belay, and took a swan dive off the cliff. As I looked out over the ledge, Tom's body banged sharply against the jagged walls. This routine was repeated eight more times, and by the end of it, Tom was covered in blood. We were all extremely shaken. Despite the grim weather, the group proceeded to climb as Gorman wanted. Dawn approached and the conditions and visibility were still fairly mild, but a few people began to worry about pushing on. The first to head down was Hillary and her mother Sharon Spray. Hillary had a stomach ache and didn't feel fit enough to complete the climb, so she turned back. She was urged to keep going, and she said she experienced pressure from the leaders to continue, but Hillary refused, and that saved her life. At Silcox Hut, a warming station at 7,000 feet, two more students wavered. One of them was Lorca Smetana, who was suffering from cramps. She returned to the lodge with another climber, Courtney Boatsman, after telling Gorman that she was in pain. Right after, they were followed down by two more climbers, and at 11.30 a.m., the group was finally whittled down to 13 when Dee Zaduniak, suffering from mild snow blindness, decided she needed to head down too. In the two-hour period after Zaduniak's departure, the bad weather descended suddenly, and it only grew worse. Ralph Summers, one of the guides and a survivor, began to question whether they should turn around. They didn't. Gorman thought the group could still summit and get down, so against reasons, they pushed on. At roughly 2 p.m., Summers saw that the conditions were simply too precarious to continue. They were above 11,000 feet and the wind was blowing hard. Finally, he was able to convince Gorman to change his mind, but it was too late. The howling storm from the Pacific had arrived and the nightmare began. Even in the deteriorating weather, there was a direct path down the mountain at least in theory, but nothing about that day was normal. At 3.30 p.m., after the group descended several hundred feet and were clustered just below the hog's back, the first problem emerged. The youngest climber, 15-year-old Patrick McGinnis, started struggling in the cold. He was slurring his speech, and he staggered and toppled over, wanting nothing more than to sleep. Visibility was now between 20 and 30 feet, a condition that induces vertigo where one cannot differentiate ground from sky, and every step is dangerous as you don't know where your foot will land. The students did their best given the situation. They surrounded McGinnis and placed him in the group's only sleeping bag. Susan McClave, a senior and an experienced climber, took off her jacket and boots and crawled inside to warm him up. The group also ignited the burner and boiled water into which they dissolve two lemon drops so that McGinnis can have a few ounces of hot, sugary carbohydrates. The rewarming process helped, but it consumed time, time they simply didn't have. Roughly an hour later, the group, now led by Summers and McClave, continued on. They were hoping to head down to safety, but all along, they were following a path to their death. Their compass was set by Gorman, who by then was speculated to already have cognitive problems caused by fatigue and the freezing cold. He set the compass 20 degrees off course 
making the climbers travel almost directly sideways across the face of the mountain instead of down. Visibility is now less than 10 feet, and the winds were only growing stronger. Summers, who was worried about crossing glaciers with its deep and large crevasses, decided to make use of their one and only shovel. He started to dig a snow cave. It was around 7 p.m., and they were at an altitude of 8,200 feet. Three days after the group began their climb, the storm was still surging. The winds at the top of Palmer chairlift were at 103 miles per hour, which qualifies as a Category 2 hurricane. The search and rescue team were informed of the trouble in Mount Hood. The student climbers who were due back hadn't been seen. Within a few hours, Mark Kelsey, a search and rescue veteran, joined the Portland Mountain Rescue Team. They showed up at the base of the hood and reached Timberline at 5.21 a.m. At 8.53 came the ground crew from the 304th Recovery Squadron, a unit of Air Force pararescuers. They were followed by other teams who brought a few Tucker Snowcats, which are big, bulky all-terrain vehicles that weighed more than two tons each. The weather was one of the worst they had seen during a search, and it was obvious that they would be risking their lives if they stepped into the maelstrom. They did it anyway. The sheriff's office established a staging area and sent searchers out into the weather. They found nothing. After all, they had no idea where to look. The vast face of the mountain was blindingly white. The wind was howling, and the snow continued to pile up. Visibility for parts of the day was less than an arm's length. Volunteers struggled to see or hear anything, but it was all for naught. The first day of the search ended with an overturned snowcat, a popped window, and rescuers still having no idea where the students might have gone. A snow cave can be a life-saving shelter during a storm emergency. At least that's what Summers had hoped when he dug one out with the help of Gorman. But the snow cave was small, measuring roughly six feet by eight feet in floor space and a height of only four feet inside. The snow cave fit six people, but there were 13 of them. It was the best they could do given that they were all exhausted. The students and adults got on their hands and knees and crawled into the small space. Legs crossed over legs, arms jammed into the snow. It was claustrophobic inside. It was a struggle and a pain to breathe. One of the survivors would later say that everyone was panicking about air. Their body heat also started to thaw the snow, building a sludge of icy cold trough and a shallow pool of ice water for whoever would end up sitting in the middle. Over time, the three-foot cave opening started getting smaller and smaller as new snow kept coming in. The group did their best to keep it open, setting up a rotation where they would take turns sitting outside in the gale force winds. At some point during the night, the wind outside the cave mouth would suck away their shovel and sleeping bag, leaving the students no choice but to use an ice axe and to move in and out of the cave to keep the entrance clear. The situation had grown untenable. The group can no longer depend on their team leader, Gorman, who was now unable to count to 10. Summers decided to leave, to try and get down and find rescuers. In a later statement, he said, the only chance to keep alive and to get help for the group was to strike out and keep walking. Molly Shula, one of the advanced climbers, volunteered to go with him. They vanished into the whiteout outside the cave, still going in the wrong direction. After a few hours, they somehow lucked out. By 9.50 a.m., they made it to the lodge of Mount Hood Meadows, a ski resort roughly two miles east of Timberline. They were saved. Eleven climbers were left in the cave, cold, scared, and desperate to survive. The group was vacillating between hope and despair. Simply stated, the American Alpine Club's summary said, events for the next two days involved a prolonged and valiant attempt on the part of the students to maintain the cave. Early Wednesday morning on the second day of rescue, the weather finally cleared. At 5.45 a.m., Mark Kelsey's team, riding in a snowcat from Mount Hood Meadows up the side of the mountain, would notice two black dots on the flank of an area called White River Canyon. Two lifeless bodies in a fetal position, one right above the other. The two were at the bottom of the hill. They were Allison Litzenberger and Aaron O'Leary. Around the same time, a different set of rescuers would spot a third body not far away, that of Eric Sandvik. Apparently at some point the previous night, Allison Litzenberger gathered her courage and went outside. It was because the cave's entrance was nearly sealed shut and everyone inside was losing air. 
Allison was small, and someone her size could still fit through the narrow opening. She braved the still-raging blizzard in the hope of clearing an air passage for the group. Both Erin O'Leary and Eric Sandvik followed her. Giles Thompson, a survivor, said that he remembers Sandvik trying to get back inside and trying to help him do so, but Sandvik couldn't get more than a single boot back through the entrance. After trying fruitlessly to get back in, Sandvik had simply fallen on the snow. He was located almost directly on top of the rest of his friends. Back at the operations base, a helicopter from the 304th Recovery Squadron took off and headed up to where the three students had been found. The three were most likely dead, but for a lengthy period of time, both law enforcement officials and members of the media had the mistaken impression that they might be alive. This might be because the helicopter radioed to base personnel that they should prepare warm oxygen, a standard treatment for hypothermia victims. This generated a horrific false hope that circulated among the parents. It was a cruel misunderstanding, a perfect storm of mistakes, according to Kelsey. Overcome with emotion, he describes returning to the base at the end of that day's search. He said he remembered getting off that helicopter, and all of the parents start moving in toward them. Just these faces of hope, he said, of desperation. Give us something, please. And to have to not say anything, that was tough. You just wanted to tell them, hold them, do something. But we weren't allowed to. There was a procedure for that. Wednesday passed with no further developments. The weather cleared, but the damage was done. All signs of the climbers had been erased. Thankfully, Master Sergeant Richard Harder did not give up. Harder was a member of the 304th, and he had earned the nickname Bagger because his first 24 missions with the 304th had unfortunately ended without any live rescues. Harder was of the firm belief that it was still possible to find the climbers, and he had an idea about where they were. Using a flare, he marked where he thought the cave was and radioed that this was where the search should concentrate, but he was met with resistance. The field OL feels that they've already covered the marked area thoroughly. It took most of the afternoon for Bagger to finally organize his own group of searchers, among them, Summers. They set up a fine probe line starting at 8,500 feet. Working three feet apart, the rescuers moved slowly down the slope, pushing 10-foot avalanche poles into the snow in a last, desperate measure. It worked. 22 minutes before the scheduled end of that day's rescue, a 304th sergeant named Charlie Eck hit something solid. They started digging frantically. Moments later, they heard moaning coming from the cave. It was a student named Britton Clark who was lying just beneath Giles Thompson in the entrance. Clark was semi-conscious and moaning. She had a core temperature of 74.12 when she was admitted at a hospital in Portland. Patrick McGinnis's core temperature was measured at 54 degrees, while the other climbers' temperatures were as low as 37.4. By the end of the mission, volunteers logged 5,874 hours on the mountain. It was a massive rescue effort, but only Clark and Thompson survived, while seven other students and two members of staff perished. Brinton Clark would spend six weeks in the hospital before making a full recovery, but Giles Thompson, despite all efforts of the medical staff, would lose his legs. Families of the seven students who died were offered settlements by the school's insurer. The McGinnis family, however, filed a lawsuit for wrongful death in September 1986. Though 48 hours before the first court date, the opposing parties were able to negotiate a settlement. The months following the disaster was a painful struggle not only to the families who lost their loved ones, but to everyone who had been touched by this tragedy. Inquiries and offers came flooding from many media publications and news outlets. All of them were asking the hows and the whys of the tragedy, asking what could have been done and who to blame. They wanted someone to point fingers, a report published in July 1986 in The Oregonian assigned blame primarily to Gorman for neglecting to turn back in bad weather, striving beyond the point of common sense to get the students to the top. Parents reacted with a mix of anger, criticism, and understanding. Susan McClave's father, Donald, told Associated Press, We will never know any of us for sure why Gorman climbed as long as he did, but he was a fine man who never would have endangered his own life let alone anyone else's. 
Years went by, and survivors and families of the deceased found different ways to cope with their life while accepting and living with the grief. Society has this idea that grief goes away or eventually you recover, says Donna Sherman, former CEO and executive director of a small nonprofit called the Dougie Center for Grieving Children and Families, where Susan McClave's mother started volunteering. But grief doesn't go away, period. It changes your life forever, and you have to accommodate to a new reality. Over the past 32 years, there has never been another Oregon Episcopal-sponsored student expedition to climb Mount Hood. The base camp, dubbed a disastrous killing program by Richard Hader Sr., whose son Richard Jr. was one of the nine victims who died in the expedition, was suspended by the school before its inquest. Thank you very much for following this story. Please feel free to hit the like button or leave a comment. Subscribe to our channel and turn on your notification bell so that you will be notified when another new video is posted. Until next time, take care.